Michael, you've been my attorney for 12 plus years. I've seen your child grow up. I mean, it's pretty amazing because he's what? How old is he actually? He's Brandon's, 22 now. He was a scrawny <clears> kid. <throat> And, you know, here you are taking a football practice. You knew you actually had a plan laid out for him. You knew exactly what you wanted to do with your child. Well, it didn't really work that way. I'm, you know, I'm not like Marinovich who put a football in the crib and forced my kid to do it. But, yeah, I mean, you know, I wanted him to get his shot, you know. I mean, when I grew up, I wanted to be an actor. I didn't get a whole lot of support from the family. And in the end, I sucked, you know. And so I wanted my kid to be able to have a shot at whatever it was that he loved. He was showing... He was showing real prospect at an early age for sports. So you've been a successful parent. Where did it all stem from? I don't really know. I mean, I had crappy parents, so I don't really know. I just woke up one day and said, my kid's going to get his shot. You know, my kid is not going to live the way I lived. So, so you know, growing up, you, you wanted to be an actor? Or was it a producer that you wanted no, to be? No, I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be an actor first, but I sucked, so I became a producer as a second choice. And then I was trying to do acting and I was in New York and I was running around in New York, you know, doing auditions and stuff. And first of all, these people were all tremendously skilled. I'm up against people from Juilliard and from, you know, Tisch School of the Arts. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. After that, I realized that my personality was better skewed towards producing. And so I started doing more producing work. So I actually left New York and went down to Florida. And down there, I was doing some acting, but I started producing down there. So in 1985, six, something like that, I did the Miss Collegiate Black America pageant. I associate, produced that. (laughs) And we had it on what was the precursor of what is now BET. Wow. Yeah. And so um, we didn't didn't do it live. um, And we had to cut it and edit it, which is a a great thing because the, the main producer didn't know what the hell he was doing. I mean, it was like, you know, the curtains would close, we'd, it would go to dark, and then we'd sit there for five minutes and nothing would happen. This guy was clueless. But it was at least the first thing I produced, and I had a, a producing credit. After I got some experience down in Florida, I went back to New York. And when I got up back up there, I moved into, I raised a little bit of money, not much, but a little bit, and moved into an office on 47th and Broadway. And there, I, on my floor, I had uh, Richard Barr, who was the president of the Theater Guild, uh, Broadway Theater Guild producers. At the time at, it was? At the time. He was the president of that. And then we also had Fred Zolo on our floor, who was a very successful um, film and, and Broadway producer. So you moved in, what is his name, Richard, right? Richard, Richard, Richard Barr. Uh-huh. Richard Barr, you know, and right. you got a lot of knowledge from the guy, obviously. Right? Yeah, yeah, he was, I mean, he was amazing. So you're clearly a go-getter to, to take that opportunity and learn from the best of the best, I would say. Yeah, but I didn't have any other choice. I couldn't work for anybody. What do you mean? Well, I mean, you know, I worked for other people. I got fired from every job I ever had. I had to do stuff on my own because I couldn't get along with anybody. So I moved into the that floor, um, you know, to do my own thing. And Richard and I got to be buddies, and he helped me out. I mean, but that was like the Jimmy Iovine at the time, you know. Would be oh, I was her. no Jimmy Iovine. No, not you, but he was. He, I mean, Sweeney Todd, I mean, they still just made a movie, what, 15 years ago. Yeah, no, he was, he was, Richard was phenomenal and he was a, he was a leader and he, yeah, he was just an amazing guy. I mean, the, the things that he did, he, he forged the, the pathway for Broadway. He was one of the first people to take Broadway musicals and turn them into operas. So here we are, fast forward, you're in your 30s, right? And uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm 30 years old at this point, okay? And I had told myself when I was in New York that if I didn't make it by age 30, I was going to try to do something else, okay? When Richard passed away, I was right when I was at 30 years old. And so I decided I'm not doing this Broadway thing anymore um, because I was still, you know, I was so close. I got so close to getting a real break, but it never really came. So uh, I just said to myself, I need to make a change. So I picked up and I moved out here. And when I got out here, I really didn't know anybody. Did you have money? How did you have money for that? Well, I had a little bit of money from New York, you know. From and, from what? What gigs did you do? Like no, you... no. In, in our producing office, we were funded. Oh, you were funded. Yeah, we were funded. So I was I was okay. I had some money. Okay, I wasn't rich or anything, but I had a little bit of money. And then I came out here and I got a job, um, and I started doing temp work and deciding what the hell I was going to do next. And I, I wanted to get into television producing, and, uh, but I didn't know anybody. 
uh, ended up taking a temp job at Hanna-Barbera. Wow. Uh, and worked there for probably nine months. Okay, so let's, let's talk about this. So here you are. You went to Florida, then New York, right? Uh-huh. right? Then back, well, not going to say back to California, but you ended up in California. Right, I came out here. Uh-huh. And then, you know, after all that, you know, your whole career of doing acting, producing, right. here you are looking at law. Right. Like, how did that even come about? Well, here, here's, how, here's how it happened. I mean, you know, in order to be in entertainment, as I said, when I was an actor, I didn't really understand what it takes to be able to create a character. When I was a producer, what I realized is I don't give a crap about anybody's story. So, you know, so once I realized all of that... Mike, you cracked me up. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, it was, it's true. I mean, I'm really not all that interested in what people do on a day-to-day Shit. basis. And I don't gossip, and I don't watch gossip shows, and I have no interest in people's lives for the most part. So the only thing that I was good at was fighting. You know, that was the only thing I could do. So I thought, okay, I'll go to law school and learn how to fight. And so how long did that take you? Uh, it's a three-year program. And how did you do in school? I did fine. You did good? Yeah, I did fine in school. Good. Okay. You know, I mean, when you're older, I think you do better in school when you're older. I do. I think, you know, when your parents are saying to you, you've got to go, you have resentment and you only are doing that work because you're being forced to. Did but you after, have that support though? Did you have what? that support? Did you what? have your parents saying go to school? Cause my parents definitely. Oh no. You know, my parents absolutely said go to school. Oh really? Yeah. But, but the thing, but what I'm saying is I had my undergraduate degree already cause I went to Rutgers. And so I graduated Rutgers in 83, but I didn't go to law school until 1990, until 1990. So what happened was during that, those seven or eight years, uh, I learned a lot, you know, I mean, you learn a lot about if you don't have money in your pocket, you can't eat. I mean, there was literally a time when I was acting where I remember this, where I got off a bus and I owed, I owed about a dollar thirty, and I had a dollar twenty in my pocket. And the bus driver stopped the. I put it in there, and he knew because it came up ten cents short. And he, the bus driver stopped the bus and chased me down the street for the dime. I dug really deep into my pocket. I actually found it. I mean, did you did you grow up fighting? Is that why you got in law school, or well, what was I the mean, reason? it's the only thing I'm good at. When you grow up in a family like mine, you're good at fighting. That's how it works. First of all. You know, we're New York. We're all New Yorkers. New Yorkers do nothing but fight. Okay, this is how a New York typical New York dinner goes. We would go to my to visit my uncle and aunt in Long Island. We would go out back, and there's a big picnic table, and everybody would sit at the picnic table. So it was me, my brother, my mother, my stepfather, my uncle, my aunt, and my three cousins. Okay, not one person heard what anybody else was said. Everybody's talking over everyone else as loud as they can to make their point. No one's listening. Okay, so you have to fight just to be heard. Wow. That's how New Yorkers live. You know, at what point, you know, when you were studying to be a lawyer, did you think you're great? And then you say, I, you know, I got this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this for my living. I don't know that I ever thought I was great. But what I did, what I did was I felt comfortable. There are two different things, right? I mean, as an actor, as a producer, I never felt 100% comfortable. I I actually gravitated more towards the logistical side of it and the contract side of it, even when I was producing. Uh, And when I got into law school, it it was just kind of fit. I understood it. I I was able to discern what what the teachers were saying when other people possibly weren't. I think that there, we have different mindsets. And my mindset was more law- law and logic related than it was on the creative side. But, but because I had experience on the creative side, I was also able to mix those two. And it was, it's been beneficial for me. You know, what's so interesting now that I really am paying attention to your history, you know, being a producer, you're seeing where the other, you know, say the, the, the defense, you're right. And, um, you said that it's defense, right. That you're putting up against like, when you're when you're suing somebody or when somebody's suing you, right? Right. The defense, which you would most of the time you yeah, most of the time I do defense. You're I don't seeing, usually prosecute. You're yeah. seeing the opposite party and seeing where they're coming from. So you're almost looking as the producer of you. You're looking at their storylines, and now you're looking at the character who's trying to sue you, and you're trying to protect your client. So you're actually understanding exactly where they're coming from, and then you're kind of like writing the script for it. And yeah, then, I you try know, to do that. Uh-huh. So it, actually, a lot of that from what you've learned in the past really is a technique, you know, from your producing days. If you really think about it. Yeah, to some extent it is, but I don't remember I'm also married to a psychologist. Do you play 
kind of like how you play chess, right? You know, you, you're strategically planning out every move, and you, you're, you're assuming that the opposite side is going to make this move, which is going to make this move, and then you've already played the game before they even made the moves. I've seen you do this. Well, yeah, but I mean, I, first of all, I think we as attorneys are taught, first and foremost, never ask a question you don't know the answer to, right? So what I try to do is I try to take that and combine that with never, never do anything that you don't have a good idea of what's going on on the other side. You know, try to figure as much out ahead of time as you can. So you graduate law school, then yeah. what? Okay, then Claire and I are living in Studio City. Married? Not married? Uh, we, were, we were married when I graduated law school. 30, 35? Yeah, I'm about 33 now. 33, oh, wow, so you 34. got married three years after. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we got, I got married three years after, yeah. And then you graduated law school three years after. So here you guys married just out of law school. Right. And so now we go back to the same issue I had before, which is I can't really work for anybody, right? I, I mean, I, I don't want to get fired. So I open up my own shop, but I really don't have any skills to do that. So I end up with dead bottom of the barrel clients with no money. And all of their problems were ridiculously idiotic. Okay, like a guy showed up to my house. He literally came to my house. He had $10 in his pocket and he wanted me to sue Warner Brothers because he, he, brought, he came with the sign. He was outside protesting Warner Brothers and he wants me to make sure he can get on the lot. So I should get in the car with him and drive over there and do whatever legal stuff I have to do to get him on the lot. For 10 bucks. For 10 bucks. Wow. Did you win? I didn't take the case. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great, Mike. Yeah. You're off to a so really good start. I was here. off to a rousing start. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it took a while. And then eventually what happened was um, I, I met different people. And uh, one of the attorneys that I met had a case in which <clears throat> his client had taken $500,000 in cash onto an airplane. And the U.S. government, and he didn't declare it. Okay. Five hundred dollars. We're talking about five hundred thousand dollars. Oh, five hundred thousand. Right. So he put five hundred thousand dollars into a suitcase. He put it on an airplane. And under our prior laws, if you take that much, it didn't matter how much money it was. If you don't declare that money when you get on an airplane, the government can take it from you. Okay. So the government took all five hundred thousand dollars. How'd they know? And I mean, they, they, dog they... sniffing dogs and all that oh, sort of wow. stuff. He had a, he, he put a fake bottom in his suitcase. So we get the case and it goes all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. We worked 14, 15 hours a day for six weeks. And, and what's really interesting is there's a, there's a constitutional attorney named Lawrence Tribe. And what Lawrence Tribe does is he argues a lot of those constitutional issues, sometimes at the Supreme Court level. So he came to us and he said, I want to take over your case. And, and we all sat down and looked at it and said, can we win? And I said, I think we can win. So then we went to, when we got to Washington, they have, they have these, uh, I don't know what to call them. It's sort of like a forum where they get lawyers together and they pretend to be the Supreme Court. And you make your arguments with them ahead of time so that they will listen to everything and tell you the feedback that they think you're going to get from the Supreme Court. Okay. That's like arbitration almost. Well, no, no, it's not arbitration. It's practice. Nine attorneys sitting up, you know, on, on a platform, listening to your arguments and giving you feedback what, about what they think will and will, won't work. Okay. And, and so we did that. And when we went in there and we made our arguments, they basically said, none of this is going to work. You guys don't have a shot in hell of winning. We won. 5-4. Wow. Mike, this is really big because you're actually a part of history because you helped change these laws. Yeah. No, it was really cool. You know, it was really a great experience. It actually, I think, was, I've done a lot of fun stuff since, but I think that was probably the most intense experience of my life. You know, when you're working on these nuances in the law and you're, you're, your mind is firing in a million miles an hour for six weeks straight, 15 hours a day, that's intense, you know. And for us to come up with these arguments, we really had to look deep. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was an incredible experience. So, but you basically did this mock trial. They said, there's no way in hell you're going to win. That's right. And then you still came out ahead. Yes, we did. And we didn't change our arguments based on what they said. I mean, we were convinced that we were right and turned out we were. But the odds were against you. So something in well, your... I don't know if the odds were against us. I think that those, you know, look, 
the, this is the thing about lawyers and doctors and anybody else who's a professional. You ask 12 people, you get 12 different answers, right? So just because you have nine people sitting up there pretending to be the Supreme Court doesn't mean that they can get inside their heads. And since they can't get inside their head, they don't know what they're really going to end up thinking. They can give you both sides of the argument. They give you their opinion as to where they think this person will come down based on prior precedent and things that they've done in the past and, you know, whatever. But you never really know. You don't know where someone's going to fall. You have this huge case that you just won. Right. What's next? Okay, so I, I ended up moving in with the, uh, the lead attorney on that case. He invited me to move into his office. They were criminal, criminal attorneys. And I, I really did. I wasn't interested in criminal at all. I mean, I tried it for a very short amount of time. It just wasn't really my thing. Um, and so I ended up, I was doing, while I was in that office, I was doing some entertainment law. I worked with the Booyah tribe, um, and I did some contracts for those guys. And uh, one of the members of the Booyah tribe had his child stolen by his ex-girlfriend or wife. I, I, think, it was a, I think it was a girlfriend. And uh, she took the baby and went to North Carolina and he was already on monitored visits, and he came to me and he said, you know, you need to get my kid back. I said, well, I'm a freaking transactional attorney. What the hell do I know about this? I write contracts for a living. He says, you're the only lawyer I know. you got to get him back. So, okay, so here, these guys are like gangster rappers. These yeah. are your entertainment clients. So what happened was we went into court, and the, court, and the judge basically said, if she doesn't come back here, we're going to order her back, and we're going to alert the FBI. And so she got wind of it, and she brought the kid back. Wow. Yeah. That's a big win. By the time I was done, I had joint custody with him, no more monitor for him, no more monitor. And so that's what, when I ended up getting you know, more family clients. One thing about you, which a lot of people don't realize, is you actually have your heart and soul in these cases, and you actually treat it like it's almost a game, and you want to win this game. Like, you actually— That's all I want to do is win. Yeah, but, but you really take it personal. Like, I want to win. Like, you— you are that guy. Some attorneys just don't care. It's about the check. You actually want no, I don't to care. win. I don't care about the check. I don't, I don't care. I'd rather make less money and win than make more money and lose. I, I don't care about the money. I mean, I do. Don't, I care about the money. <laughs> um, but, but the bottom line is, you know, i got to feed my family. But, but I don't. Ultimately, it's about winning. You know, the, the, if you're going to get in this game, you want to win. No clue why I like winning, but I love it. No, you do. You know why? I really because don't. It, it makes I, you ignite, ignite, some, ignite something. Like no, some here's, game. here's what I know. I love to win. I hate to lose. And, and most of the people who win more have that feeling. You know, we do a lot of sports stuff, right, in our family. It's the same thing. You're driven to win. If you lose and you don't feel anything, you don't belong in a competitive environment. Do you believe that there's just certain people that have a skill set that are just born to be winners? Well, like you. You know, it's an interesting question. And the reason is because I do believe that everyone is born to be a winner. Everyone. I think they have to find the correct avenue. Okay? So here's what I think the problem is in our society. What do we value? We value sports. We value acting. We value rich and famous. We, but, I mean, there are parents that have said, I would rather that my child has a Super Bowl ring than go and get a Nobel Prize. That's insane, okay? So it, a part of this has to do with how we define winning. That's part of it. If a kid, if a kid is um, predisposed towards science and we're saying that they're a failed high jumper, Okay, well, yeah, they're a failed high jumper. They're, they could have been a successful scientist had you just taken them down that path. So I believe that virtually everybody has killer instincts in some area for something. Uh, that most of us are just missing the mark. But actually, though, you said it best, though. You know, you said that you got fired or let go of on almost every job. Then you right. said, I want to become an attorney because I'm really great at fighting. I came from a family where you had to overspeak people in order to get your words out. Right. And so you did this for a living, and this is where you fit best in the life yeah. of Michael Heiklin. Well, I think it was my best chance of making a living. You know, It was the thing that, that was natural to me. Um, and that, that's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, I, I wanted to be an actor, but I was a lawyer. Me and you both know that you're kind of like Hollywood's biggest secret. You know, you've won for I hope nu so. numerous, numerous clients. And we're not talking just about some C, B actors. We're talking about some really high profile A actors well, and entertainers and rappers and everybody else that goes in between. Yeah, I think that 
I've been lucky. You've been. I think we have great people around us, you know. And when you have great people around you, it's easier to get the job done. In your opinion, what makes a good attorney, you know, a, a good attorney? I think that's a that that's a hard that's a hard question because I think that everyone brings bias to the table. Okay, so how you work is directly related to your pre-existing biases and how you think. So there are lawyers out there who are tremendously meticulous and they will go through every tiny little detail, you know, so the, the, they'll deal with it on that level, on the micro level. Then there are other lawyers who deal with things on the macro level and they can both be equally successful. I think that there is no relationship between hype and quality. Okay, so there are plenty of lawyers out there who are hyped up. They're in the media. They're on billboards. You see them on television. It doesn't mean they're good lawyers. Okay, because 97 percent of all cases settle. And if that's a true, true statement, which it is, which as far as we know it is, um, then if 97 percent of the cases are going to settle, it doesn't matter who your lawyer is. You're going to end up with some sort of a settlement. Now, how much more or how much less? may have something to do with the quality of your lawyer. But the question for me always is, what's the offset? In other words, if you've got a $250 an hour lawyer and you end up with $30,000, or you have a $750 an hour lawyer and you end up with $40,000, did you pay $500 more for the other lawyer and did it make up the difference in the $10,000 on the other end? And if it did, then don't go out of pocket. It doesn't make any sense. You don't want to be paying a lawyer, digging a huge hole and trying to fill it back in. Okay, so all that hype stuff, it doesn't necessarily mean anything um, unless you get to trial. Now, once you get to trial, you can always substitute a new new attorney in. Right. And if only three percent of those cases or less are going to go to trial, then there's really no reason to have the top trial attorneys all the way through. So it's the whole thing is part of a a, the whole system is sort of a game. Um, But ultimately, I think the best lawyers do for their, they do this for their clients. Let me put it this way. They make sure that the amount that they charge is less than the amount that their clients gain. Okay. Because more often, not more often than not, but I have seen instances in which the attorneys end up making more money and the clients end up getting nothing or, you know, even could end up having to go out of pocket. And half the time that is kind of like you because you'll give value to a client even before you sign them on to a case. I know that you've worked with them and just to find out even if there is a case and you half the time you'll tell them, no, don't go to me. I think you should do it this way. Well, it's a pet peeve of mine. You know, I have to be able to sleep at night and I'm not going to take people's money. Again, this goes back to winning. I'm not going to take people's money unless I can look at the situation clearly and see that there's a prospect to win. And then once I know either as prospect to win, the next question is, can I win without bankrupting my client? Are they going to get benefit as well? And if they're not, then there's no sense in me taking the case. And that is the difference between Michael Heiklin and most attorneys. Well, I can't speak to that, but I will, say that, I will say that it's something that's very important to me. How do you know you have the attorney right where you want them? It actually is a two-step process, okay? The first thing is that they start making personal attacks because they no longer have a valid argument. So you get that first. Then you know you've got them because they're no longer on a, have a valid legal argument. And then the next thing is everything goes dead quiet when you call them on it. Once there's dead quiet, you got them. When you go up against a huge law firm, does that make you feel a certain way or? What do you mean? Am I concerned? Yeah, are you concerned? Yeah, not even remotely. Why is that? Why? When you beat the U.S. government, it doesn't get much bigger than that. So, Mike, I want to wrap this up. I really appreciate you coming and giving a little bit of insight. I was here anyway. That's not true. We forced you. <laughs> Some of the people that don't know how to get a hold of you, uh, they can find you on Instagram at Heikland Law or HeiklandLawGroup.com. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. Thanks. If you like what you've heard, subscribe on iTunes or your podcast app. Follow us on Instagram at AllTiedUp. Tune in next week for our new episode.